So good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining today's Cut Carbon, Cut Costs webinar on save money on your energy bills and practical steps to reduce energy use. Um, this webinar is going to give you tips and actions that you can take away immediately and put into place in your businesses to help reduce those rising bills. So unfortunately, we haven't got Martin Lewis here today, uh, so we had to settle for second best in uh, in Carl Hurst and Rebecca Bocock from our sustainability and net zero team at the Growth Hub who support businesses to reduce their, their energy usage. Next slide, please, Bex. So this webinar is the second in a series of four webinars taking place each Tuesday at 11 a.m. Uh, so we have the following topics coming up over the next two Tuesday and uh, the one on the 7th of March, which is what is the role of sustainability in winning tenders and new business? And the one the following week uh, is how sustainable marketing strategy can lead to a competitive advantage. If you've not already booked onto these, I would strongly recommend you do so and we'll send out the details following this session. Next slide, please, Tex. So just before we jump onto the, the Cut Carbon, Cut Cost webinar, I just wanted to talk to you about the Skills for Growth SME Support Programme, who's hosting today's session. Now, if you're not already aware of the, uh, the SME Support Programme, so we are aimed at uh, increasing skill levels in organizations. So essentially what we do is we understand what gaps you've got in your organization. We understand what your employees do and what skills are going to make them more effective and more productive in their role. And then we help match them up with skills and training that is going to meet their skill needs. We try and find fully funded, part funded and offer commercial training to the clients that we work with. Next slide, please, Bex. So just to give you a bit of an example about some of the fully funded skills that are currently available through the Skills for Growth program around project management, there's digital skills, so digital marketing, uh, cybersecurity, digital leadership, uh, project management for digital transformation. There is around increasing your SEO, um, Google Analytics, those type of areas. There's a whole host of leadership skills depending on which organization you're from and general leadership skills for, for sort of cross sector. There are sector specific skills and within manufacturing, health and social care, early years and construction. And through joining the program, you'll get access to over 400 fully funded courses. Thank you. And here's how to access the program today. So if you're not already on program, uh, you can visit skillsforgrowthsme.co.uk or you can follow us on LinkedIn and these uh, links will be sent to you afterwards. So just before I hand over to uh, Carl and Rebecca, if you could just put in the chat whereabouts you heard about this webinar today, whether it was from uh, and maybe an email that you got off myself or if you found it through Eventbrite, we'd love to know and find out how you found out about today's session. If you could pop that in the chat today, I think there was something in the in the in the chat about um, someone not being able to receive the slides. Is that the same for everybody just before we kick off or is that? Uh, just the one person. If you could just post it, if you can see this, the uh, you can see slides. Right, Fabius. I think it may just be because you're joining on your phone. Um, might be worth seeing if there's a different way to maybe join the session. But anyway, I'll pass on to Carl and Rebecca, and obviously go through the uh, the today's session. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. As Tom said in his introduction, this is the second webinar of four in the Cut Carbon Cut Cost series. The series is a whistle stop introduction to some of the themes associated with environmental sustainability and energy efficiency. This second session will give you an idea of how to reduce costs, followed by an introduction into renewables and electric vehicles. Presentation will be around 45 minutes long, with about 15 minutes at the end for any thoughts or questions. And you're welcome to put questions into the chat as we go along. Just before you start, Carl, it might be worth just flicking off your camera. Um, might be. Yeah, is it difficult to hear me? No. It's just uh, bouncing out a little bit. It might, okay. might help. Yep, try it with that. Okay. Thank you. 
So, as Tom mentioned, today's return to myself, Carl Hurst, my colleague Bex Bocox. We're both sustainability and net zero advisors with the Business Growth Hub. And Tom, who's topping and tailing the session. I'll start by introducing what we do in the sustainability and net zero team. Our sustainability and net zero service helps businesses to minim minimise inefficiencies within their operations and quantify and reduce their carbon emissions. We offer on resource efficiency reviews and one to one support to help identify opportunities and quantify cost and carbon savings. We also help businesses to calculate their carbon footprint and develop an action plan to improve. We can help you to build a business case for investment in low carbon technologies and help you to develop an environmental strategy. And we can support you to implement projects, find local suppliers of green technologies and access funding. And we also run a programme of webinars similar to this. It's longer and goes into more depth is called the journey to net zero for businesses that would like to improve sustainability and don't know where to start. And there's a link to our services in the slide pack. Let's take a look at uh, energy bills. Check that your bills are accurate to make sure you benefit from the current price cap. Most businesses should have smart meters. If you don't, and provide your supplier with meter readings. And the same applies at home. Meter readings with a knee at this side are estimated and are usually more than the energy that you've used. Most businesses pay 20% VAT unless you qualify for the reduced rate of 5%. Charities and very small energy business energy users do that. Transmission and distribution charges, or TUOS and DUOS, are charges for the use of systems to maintain the network infrastructure. They may appear as a separate line in your bill or may, may be included in a rolled up cost per kilowatt hour. Many businesses pay authorised supply capacity charges as part of distribution use of systems. Make sure you're only paying for the capacity that you really need. I recently saved a client £100 a month as he was paying for 400 kVA supply capacity when he was using less than 300 and it costs around £1 per kVA per month. There are schemes for businesses where you get a reduction for not using electricity at peak times, similar to the trials you may have noticed going on in the domestic market, with so-called flexi schemes, where you get a rebate for reducing your use at tea times when asked by the supplier. Has anyone been taking part in these uh, in these schemes? Maybe not. Depending on your um, contract type, you can also make savings on transmission and distribution costs. Transmission charges are based on the national grid's three highest half hour demand periods called trials. You are charged for the amount of electricity that you use in that period. If you reduce your trial demand, significant savings can be made. Electricity suppliers and brokers offer triad warning services to forecast when to reduce usage. And these are typically at winter tea time periods. Similarly, distribution charges are split into red, amber, green. With red winter tea time periods, again, charge two or three times more than at other times of day, which are also amber in winter. And summer and nighttime periods are green, which are about half the amber winter period charges. You can use the data from your smart meters to see how much you're using at these times and work out your potential savings. As I said, for accurate bills and to monitor en energy consumption, it's important to have accurate meter readings. If you haven't got a smart meter, ask your supplier or landlord for one. You get lots of useful information from them. Take meter readings monthly. And if you also take them on a Friday night and a Monday morning, you can see how much is used at weekends. Check your meter readings against your bills. Suppliers have been known to get readings wrong. To enable good comparison, normalize the data against your business KPIs, for example, output, turnover, staff numbers, 
this can help compare your this year to last year or this week to last week so you can target improvements. I'd just like to mention the news from yesterday. Off Gem, off Gem's energy price cap has fallen by around a thousand pounds to three thousand two hundred and eighty pounds for an average household for the April to June quarter. And the government cap on subsidies increasing from two and a half thousand pounds to three thousand pounds for an average user for the next twelve months. So we'll all be paying a bit more as the sixty pound per month discount is also ending. The good news is that wholesale prices are falling. And the off GM cap is forecast to be below two and a half thousand pounds from July. So we'd be paying a bit, little bit more in the short term, but hopefully if it stays warm, it won't cost us too much of that short uh, in the, over the next quarter before bills fall again. If you ask your supplier for half power data from your smart meter, there are a few apps where your daily usage pattern can be examined. Most suppliers provide these. These two graphs of a client's electricity consumption. The one on the left shows a client's day of maximum demand. This can be compared with your authorised supply capacity that I just mentioned to make sure you aren't paying for capacity that you don't need. The graph on the right shows equipment on a timer that comes on every weekday. In this case, it was during the Christmas shutdown last year and it wasn't required. The client realised that it wasn't needed every working day either. So it's now changed how it's used, saving £20 a day or £3,000 for the whole year. Any questions for what, uh, what we've covered so far? OK, now let's look at some of the energy using equipment in your businesses, starting with lighting. Lighting is generally one of the big consumers of energy in commercial property. But do you know what type of lighting you have in your building? Does anyone know what light number one is in the picture? Please shout out. Anybody know what this light is? Is it a fluorescent tube strip light? It is, it is. It's a single fluorescent tube. What about uh, number two? These are commonly found in uh, in offices. It's a fluorescent T8 quad, two foot by two foot, and with ballast, it's got a total load of about 100 watts. Number three, anyone know what that is? A portable light. It's actually a metal halide floodlight. And these can be 250 or 400 watts. Um, quite often you can find them um, in high bays and warehouses. Number four. That's just an old fashioned incandescent light bulb. And number five. That's similar to the, um, the, the, T, the quad that we looked at before. It's uh, a 40 watt LED panel. And it's less than half the wattage of the fluorescent fitting in picture two. Also, LED lights can last between five and ten times longer than other fittings, which is particularly useful in warehouses with high fittings, where you may require scaffolding or a cherry picker to change the lights. The lighting can be responsible for 40% of your building's electricity use particularly in offices and warehouses. So I'll look at some quick wins, obviously, switching lights off when not needed. Maximise the use of daylight. Make sure skylights and windows are kept clean and turn lights off in areas with good daylight. Label the light switches to make it easier to find the right switch. For example, racking aisles in a warehouse. And ensure lighting levels are appropriate activity in that area. Non-critical areas such as corridors are often overlit. Lighting controls can save up to 50% in a typical office. And there are three main types of lighting controls, timers, occupancy sensors, and daylight sensors. 
Timers can help prevent lights accidentally being left on out of hours. Occupancy sensors are useful for areas which are used intermittently, such as storage rooms. Daylight sensors can detect sunlight and only turn lights on when there isn't sufficient daylight. You can also upgrade to LED lighting to save two thirds of just to use for lighting in a typical business. Quick example, savings from changing to LEDs. Current lighting is 100, 100 lights, uh, 70 watts, six, foot, six foot fluorescent tubes. And the current annual energy use based on nine hours a day, five days a week, 50 weeks a year. So 100 times 70 watts, plus the 15% ballast loss, times the 2,250 hours. It's over, over 18,000 kilowatt hours per year. To replace that, new lighting, 130 watt LEDs. And the new annual energy use is 100 times the 30 watts times the 2,250 hours. Of 6,750 kilowatt hours per year. That's a saving of over 11,000 kilowatt hours, 2.4 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent, and 3,409 pounds per year based on 30, the current 30 pence per kilowatt hour. Typical cost to replace the fittings would be around 50 pounds per fitting which would be a total of about £5,000 in this case, a one and a half year payback. And I've seen a number of schemes with quicker paybacks recently due to the increase in electricity costs. Aside from lighting, another big energy user in buildings is heating. Heating and hot water accounts for over one third of UK organisations' energy consumption. So look at some quick wins in the heating side. Uh, to use timers, thermostats, and thermostatic radiator valves. A one degree reduction can save eight percent off your heating bill. Don't obstruct heaters and radiators, and don't heat unoccupied rooms. Avoid using portable electric heaters. Remember to switch up any oil filled, oil filled heaters out of hours because they're easy to forget because they don't make a noise. Look at draft proofing and insulating cylinders and pipes that have an average payback of a few months. Look at servicing your boiler every year. You could save 2% on your heating costs. Your boiler is over 15, year old, 15 years old it probably needs replacing. Upgrading your boiler could save 30% of heating costs. Bear in mind that gas will be being phased out. And there's a growing trend for the electrification of heating, and in particular for heat pumps. Consider upgrading your windows and make sure your roof or ceiling is well insulated. And if you have high bays, use these stratification fans to recirculate hot air from the apex of the building. Another good energy saving action is to ensure that workshop heater is switched off if a roller shutter door is open. And this can be done using a simple interlock control. This photo shows a well insulated hot water cylinder on the left. And the image on the right was taken by a thermal Im imaging camera you can clearly see the heat loss from the uninsulated pipework. Insulation is low cost and payback can usually be expected within a few months of installing. Looking at ventilation and cooling. Some simple quick wins. Don't have open windows if the air conditioning is on. Don't cool unoccupied rooms or heat them in the summer. Check the temperature settings. You don't need cooling below 24 degrees. 
set a dead band of 5 degrees centigrade to eliminate simultaneous heating and cooling. So set your heating at 19 degrees C and your cooling at 24 degrees. Also have regular air conditioning inspection, inspections to check for leaks. Refrigerate, refrigerant gases are bad for the environment and much worse than carbon dioxide. Mainly avoid having heating and cooling systems on at the same time. Looking at equipment and machinery. Again, switch on equipment when it's not needed. Enable power save or power down settings. And disconnect any surplus equipment which is not in use. Install timers and control machines and check those settings regularly. And specify energy efficient models when buying new equipment. A simple example in the office, a water cooling, water cooler, vending machine or coffee machine. We help DJS Research to install timers on their water coolers. Very low cost to install, about £15, and saving them over nearly £150 per year. Many of these actions are fairly simple and fairly obvious. That may be so, but many businesses don't do any of them. But the price rises in the last 12 months are now making people think about it. So a quick look at compressed air. The manufacturing companies who use compressed air, it can be a large proportion of your electricity costs. When looking at the whole life cost of a compressor, the energy cost actually makes up around 73% of the total costs, whereas the initial investment is only 18%. Some words save on your compressed air costs include Switching compressors off when not in use. An idling compressor uses around 40% of its full load. Fixed air leaks, even a tiny one millimeter leak, could cost you more than 700 pounds a year in wasted energy. And conducting the compressor and fixing all the leaks could save your business a considerable amount of money. Operating your compressor at a lower pressure will use less energy. So it's worth checking that the compressor isn't running at a higher pressure than necessary. Compressed air is often generated at the compressor's maximum pressure, often 7 bar or 100 psi. Reducing the pressure by 10% can lead to 5% savings in energy use. Make small incremental reductions to the pressure and check the operations aren't affected. Also check if compressed air is actually necessary for the job. An electric tool may do the job just as well and will be cheap to run. And compressors work most efficiently when the inlet air is cool, clean and dry. Compressors are often in warm rooms, which makes the machine harder. Ducting the inlet, inlet air from outside can res result in great energy savings. It's like the situation by mentioning the true cost of waste. Like an iceberg, there are small visible costs, for example, cut the cost of skips or effluent and landfill charges. But think about all the hidden costs. I'd like you to shout out and let me know what you think the hidden costs of waste in a, biz in a manufacturing business is. Anybody got any ideas? Not a very talkative lot today. Wasted energy use, like what you've just been talking yep. about, not having some of those measures in place. Yep. You don't realise that it's wasted because you haven't measured it. Yeah, great, Louise. Thanks for that. Anybody else? Okay. These are the ones that we, we, we've come up with. So as, as Louise mentioned, the energy costs. So energy and raw materials. That go into creating that waste, the costs of labour, transportation and storage, as well as rework costs and the lost profit of being able to sell the product. The true cost of waste is actually around 4% of turnover, 
think about how that actually compares with your profitability. Really think about your business and how you do things. There are many savings to be made in energy and other resources. So if you need any support, please let us know. We can come out and see you and look at, look at your business. Has anybody got any questions on the presentation so far? Hey Carl, we've got a couple in the chat. Um, one from Louise about impact of the business for on businesses from the off-gem price cap. Yeah, that's changing significantly as well. Um, uh, we would cover this in the uh, in the webinar last week. The um, I think the, the savings are quite being reduced quite dramatically. I can't remember the exact figures off the top of my head. I think the um, something like one you a discount of up to one point nine pence on your electricity per kilowatt hour, and about point to uh, six seven pence I think it is on your um, on your gas cost per kilowatt hour but as I, as I mentioned before the um, the actual um, wholesale costs are coming coming down quite considerably so your business the the cost that your supplier is going to be charging you going forward will be less than the uh, the the, um, the threshold where the uh, the discounts come into play so I, I would expect your bills to come down quite significantly over the next two or three months I hope that covers what you were asking Louise yeah it was just for customers and for businesses so it, I didn't attend last week so it referenced your home energy bills I was just I wasn't aware we actually in the shared office um, and yeah. that businesses got um, a benefit from the price cap that was all yeah currently it, it's round about 10 or 11 11 p per kilowatt hour on electricity and that's going to go down to less than 2 p so it's the uh the government support is going to be a lot less going forward but like i said the um the wholesale coming down i expect uh businesses and and uh in your homes as well i mentioned it because because it was all over the news yesterday well thank you was there another point tom yeah, we've got. Um, do you know how much energy is actually saved when using the sleep power save button on a desktop, for example? Uh, I don't off the top of my head. Do you know, Bex? Um, I'm not too sure. Um, I think there is that thing. I think it's called like a vampire drain or something. And that um, when you put your things on standby, there still is that drain of power. Um, and I think over the over the throughout the UK that is quite a significant um, contributor to our emissions so there's definitely um, an impact there and it's something to keep in mind that things aren't left on standby but I'm not sure of the of the exact figure. I think I think it's something like 15 to 20 pence a night and um, so if you've got a number of uh, number of computers that you need turning down in, in the office then that can so mm -hmm. soon add up to uh, five to ten pounds per per night worth con definitely worth considering thank you is that that's it. Is that that, it okay that's it now hand up the okay so i'll uh, now hand you over to bex who's going to talk about uh, renewable energy uh yes so i'm going to be looking at renewable renewable energy and then also a little bit on electric vehicles so before we look at renewables i wanted to introduce the energy hierarchy which is very similar to the waste hierarchy which i'm sure we're all familiar with so while the waste hierarchy ranks most preferred to the least preferred options for waste management the energy hierarchy lists the actions policymakers and industry and also consumers need to take when it comes to energy sources and use in order of most sustainable to least. So if we have a little look at this hierarchy here, the top one and the most sustainable is is represented as leaner and this is around behavior change around reducing those consumptions so an example of this might be doing a bit of an internal campaign within your staff to get them to be turning their computers off at the plug for example or turning the lights off keener is around efficient use of energy and this is relying on technology to reduce consumption 
So an example of this might be getting your old fluorescent lighting tubes and upgrading to LEDs. Next comes greener, and this is around increasing the use of low carbon energy sources such as solar PV, which we'll come to in a moment. And then we start to look at cleaner. So as you can see here, now we are coming to the bottom of this this hierarchy and the most uh, and the least sustainable part. So when, when we're talking about cleaner, it highlights the continued use of fossil fuels as part of our energy mix with an emphasis on using them in a more sustainable and cleaner way, such as adding carbon capture. And then finally, the least sustainable, we have this MENA, which is high emission energy. And this really is a business as usual approach using fossil fuels as we do now while we have the resources. So whilst today we are going to be talking about renewable um, energy and renewable sources, the thing to really take away from this is there are two parts of the energy hierarchy to look at first, which is, you know, getting your staff on board with being a little bit more um, energy saving, but then also, you know, implementing um, technologies to increase the efficiency of, of the energy that you use. So I'm going to do a quick poll here. Um, I don't know if you could pull that up now for me, Zoe. Um, and what I want to understand is, has anybody, where, where are people at with their re renewable energy journey? Are people thinking that, they are, that they've already installed renewable energy? They want to, but there are some barriers or it's not something that they want to do. Um, I don't know if, if Zoe that's popped up because I can't. Ah, brilliant. Yeah, so there is the question. So have Popped you up, thought, yeah. thought about installing renewables on your site? Yes, we have installed renewables. Yes, we have thought about this, but not yet installed any renewables. Or no, we don't we, we don't want to or we don't have any plans. So I will put Steve for the purpose of this. OK, so the majority, we, we haven't got anyone here that's any, installed any renewables on their site, but we have the majority of people have thought about this, but they've not yet installed any renewables. Um, for those that have answered that question, um, I'd be really interested to understand what your barriers there are for not installing those renewables just yet, if, if you're comfortable to, to share that with us and shout out or put it in the chat. Or if we've got anyone. So, yeah, so some of the barriers we usually see with this is not being able to uh, find the a, a supplier to come and do the work or you're not too sure about what is the right technology for you. Um, or it might be that initial payback of, a you know, it's big capital cost up front um, and you might not have that at the moment, moment with your business. Um, but if you do have any any barriers that you do want to discuss with us, but you don't feel like you want to share them with the whole group, as, as I say, me and Carl will are happy to help you with that journey. We've got one here, Bex, that oh, said brilliant. Uh, that they've said that they're unsure if they're staying in the current premises at the moment. Yeah, that's really good because obviously, I mean, when we've looked at if we take solar panels for an, for an example, when we previously looked at solar panels and the payback, we used to see around a seven year uh, payback on a solar panel. So you'd really need to be thinking about how long are you staying in those premises for. However, as the technology has improved, but also the price of um, electricity has increased, that payback has dropped down to around three to five years. So, um, it, you know, it is really important to consider how long you are going to stay within a premises, but also keep in mind those payback periods. Yeah, we've got a few more come in. Um, so renting offices. So obviously getting that agreement with the landlord. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely another another barrier we see in when we're speaking to clients we have actually done a blog um all about engaging with your landlord in this sort of space so that's something we can share at the end of this workshop as well and then we've also got someone that that is their home is their office um so the cost of installing renewables at home or changing to an electric car is too high at the moment for their current business yeah yeah um yeah I know that, yeah, a fair fair barrier to this is that cost and that initial pay um, capital cost to, to install something like solar PV. 
but yeah if you do have the funds it is definitely worth investing in but yeah take it within your stride so most, yeah just add that most most suppliers will uh will do some sort of lease purchase scheme you can pay for it out of the savings as you go along yeah um, yeah, so as, as Carl says, I don't think we cover this in that, but yeah, there's the different agreements you can make. So some suppliers might actually put solar panels on your roof for free and then you'll pay, you'll buy back a kilowatt hour at a reduced price, but you'll never actually own those solar panels. So I know we just focus a little bit there on solar panels, but there are many different renewable energy sources available for businesses. But the suitability will depend on the space available for the technology or storage, the geographic positioning of the organisation, building suitability, and then also legalities such as planning permission. And that's just to name a few. So I just wanted to um, do a bit of an overview of the different options that are available. So there is wind power. So we've all seen these, these use wind turbines to generate electricity for business. And these are suitable if you do have acres of building free land and also that planning permission. There's also solar panels. So as we know, these use sunlight to generate electricity. What you will need to do is an assessment of the roof of your building um, to ensure that solar panels are suitable. So I uh, probably about six months ago now when um yeah so it was october when people were thinking about uh future proofing in terms of the electricity prices going up a lot of people invested in solar panels and what this meant is that the demand went through the roof with the suppliers and the suppliers started being a little bit pickier with the type of roofs that they would work on so a bit of feedback we got from clients was that some suppliers were saying um we're not going to install on a slate roof but we'll um but we would install on you know like a tin roof on sort of a manufacturing business but that's not the not the case with every 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 supplier so if you do have slate roofs don't think that solar panels aren't appropriate for you just something to be mindful of um but there is also that um, that you need to when you're thinking about solar pv and they do do come and do an assessment of your roof they will assess that the, sh the roof is actually strong enough to support solar panels so just something to keep in mind there there is solar thermal energy so this uses sunlight to heat the water stored in your hot water tank uh, these are really easy to install and can be fitted onto the side of your building we also have biomass systems. So these generate electricity and heat by burning or fermenting organic materials such as straw or wood pellets. Um, and this is with a combined heat and power plant. You may have heard of air to air heat pumps, but in terms of renewable, there are geothermal and ground source heat pumps. Now they usually use low level heat that is naturally contained in the ground to provide both heating and cooling. Um, these do require a lot of space uh, because what they'll do is they'll put these pipes sort of underneath your your business so they do require a lot of space there another one is combined heat and power and this uses a system to capture the heat produced by electricity to heat your water and then finally um and i know this one probably isn't applicable to anyone in the room and probably not that many businesses across the whole of um, the UK but hydroelectric power generates electricity from water flowing through an immersed turbine or water wheel and as I say these are site specific but they can provide a reliable energy source. So what are the business benefits of installing renewables? So they do provide stable energy costs um, sustainable energy because uh, because you are reducing that uh, dependency on fossil fuels it can provide another income so if we take solar solar panels for example you, you can sell your surplus generated electricity back to the grid usually they'll buy it back for around um, i think it's about three pence correct if i'm wrong there carl three to five pence um they, they'll then buy that electricity back off you i mean it's always worth ensuring that you are using the electricity that you're generating yeah. another yeah, typically five pence but octopus energy have been recently been purchasing at 15 pence 
that's really so good. It's worth, it's worth looking around. Yeah. yeah. Um, and just just to, you know, before when we were talking about payback periods, you can sort of integrate what that surplus income might be to support that payback and to support that business case for installing uh, solar panels. So another business benefit to this is around reducing your emissions and it can help you to meet any carbon reduction targets that you do have. And also um, it improves your business reputation. So customers and stakeholders do value that commitment to sustainability. But there are some things to consider when you're choosing um, if to Im implement renewable energy generation on your site. So as we mentioned before, not all renewables will be appropriate for your site. For example, you may not have acres of building for your land to install wind, wind, wind sorry, not windows, wind or a roof that is suitable for um, solar panels. You should also consider what type of energy your business requires and would the renewable te technology generate the energy your business demands. And it is likely that the, gener the energy that you generate from your renewables will not actually meet your full demand and that you may have to buy additional energy from alternative sources such as a grid. So again, I'll use the solar PV example. We expect those panels to meet 10 to 30 percent of your electricity demand. Which basically means that you will have to find 90 to 70% um, of your electricity from elsewhere. So you, that, you know, you are going to still have to buy additional energy from the grid. Keep in mind and consider how the weather and the seasons may impact your energy generation. And also be aware of those upfront costs and payback periods. And as I said earlier, though, with the cost of energy increasing, the business case for renewable technologies is ever attractive. And we can support you with that. So if you do have an idea for a project that you want to implement, um, we can help you look at what that business case might look like in that payback period. So next, I'm going to move on to electric vehicles. If we don't have any uh, questions about the things I've just discussed then, actually. Good, okay. Yeah, so I'll move on to electric vehicles here. So with increasing consumer demand, greater availability of vehicles and also government support, the sales of electric vehicles are growing strongly in parallel to the development of UK charging point infrastructure. According to the latest vehicle stats, electric car sales have increased by 186% in 2020 and then in EVs enjoyed another record year in 2021, with more than one in 10 new vehicles being electric. As we can see here, the electric car market is growing quickly with over 590,000 pure electric cars on UK roads at the end of October 2022 and more than a million plug-in models um when we're including plug-in hybrids which we'll get into in a minute so it's really um i think this is incredible really this growth that we've seen in electric vehicles so note here this bev and phev we're going to cover that now so you can get a bit of an understanding the difference between the two and how they are going to impact be impacted by legislation that's coming up in the future so pev or as we call them evs are pure electric vehicles and these are powered by an electric battery um, only and they typically have a range of around 100 to 200 miles. A plug-in hybrid vehicle, so a PHEVs, um, unlike EVs, these plug-in hybrid vehicles are powered by a combination of electricity and fossil fuel, so either petrol or diesel. PHEVs have a smaller battery than pure electric cars, which means they have a maximum um, range of around 15 to 30 miles. And when that battery is empty, the combustion engine will power the vehicle until the battery is recharged again. So in terms of upcoming legislation, the government policy, such as the phase out of the sale of new petrol and diesel vans, by 2030 and that all new cars and vans should be fully zero emission at the tailpipe by 2035 is likely to promote the uptake of battery electric vehicles. Only 
and this is really, really important to remember that only battery electric vehicles and hydrogen fuel cell cars are, consi are considered zero emissions at the tailpipe. Hybrid vehicles are not eligible for zero rate road tax and no new hybrid vehicles will be manufactured after 2035. Until April 2025, electric vehicles are exempt, but an annual vehicle ex uh, like a uh, road tax of charge for cars will now be £10 in the first year, then £165 from the second year of registration onwards. The cost of this to, for electric vans will be £290. So what are the incentives here of electric vehicles? So through your organisation, there might be an opportunity for salary sacrifice for EV schemes. So this is where you pay for your vehicle before um, any other tax comes out of your pay. There are grants available for both at your home and also workplace um, charging grants. So these are vouchers for up to £350 off the cost of installing a charger. And as I said, these are available through the electric vehicle home charge scheme, but also through workplace charging scheme, both um, delivered through the government. There is a vehicle tax, as we've just mentioned, coming up in 2025, but it is a reduced, um, a reduced rates. And there is an exemption from those clean air zones and congestion charges when you're um, driving a fully electric vehicle. And because there is reduced um, less moving parts in an electric vehicle, it does mean that there's those reduced maintenance costs to benefit from. So that is everything from myself and Carl. Um, if you do have any questions, feel free to throw them at me and Carl now. And we'll do our best to answer. Open up the chat. Just just to answer Louise's question from from before, the <coughs> the current um, price cap for electricity is twenty one point one pence per kilowatt hour, for, and that's an, until the end of March. Um, that's on the wholesale cost, so your actual cost will be about thirty pence per kilowatt hour. But the um, that's changing to a discount on. Uh, uh, on electricity of 1.961 pence per kilowatt hour and that's if the wholesale cost goes above 30 pence per kilowatt hour and similarly for gas the, the current uh, cap is 7.5 pence per kilowatt hour on the wholesale cost and that's going to be reduced to a discount of 0.697 pence per kilowatt hour if the wholesale cost goes above 10p per kilowatt hour just to clarify the numbers I gave you before. Thanks, Carl. Brilliant. Um, well, thank, thank you very much for everyone for attending today. Um, just on your screen now, it just shows the, the session next week that's coming up on Tuesday at 11 o'clock, which is what is the role of sustainability on winning tenders and new business? If you're not already booked on, you can do that and we'll be sending out links following this session. But if there's no other further questions, um, Thank you very much for attending today. I think, um, Ellen, just to respond to your question there, um, I think that our link to our servers, services on the Sustainability Net Zero team, they'll be in the follow-up email, so you'll be able to get in touch with us that way. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone, for your input as well and contributions. Thanks. Bye. Hey, cheers, guys. Bye. Bye.